Next Wonder podcast. I am your host, Kristen Yorka, and today we're exploring the magic of books, specifically books as a vehicle to explore larger themes not easily conveyed by common language, and in particular, the book, the cult classic, 20 Days of Turin. Today, our guest is Luca Signorelli, and we could call him the linchpin or the reason why this book is now available in English for us English speakers. Welcome, Luca. Uh, thank you for having me here. Yes, of course. Um, so this book, the reason I initially picked it up, um, not only because I'm familiar with Turin and we have family there, but also because the the blurb, the the back of the book or like summaries online, they all said there's this library and people are going to it in the story and the books in the library are kind of like private journals from other citizens and people are going there and kind of randomly picking up these books, which sounds to me like the internet, right? Or social media at least. Yes, um, precise. But this is 1970s when it was written. If I'm not mistaken, it was like 1975. Uh, it, the book was written between 1976 and mm. 1977, uh, even if I uh, am aware that uh, Giorgio De Maria, the author, uh, had this idea from way back. Uh, it, it, it is, but he, he decided to to work into the 20 days of Turin uh, because um, he, he, it's part, I'm, I'm aware of talking with, with his family, that he was partly a way to exorcise some inner trouble that he was starting mm. to have, and he would eventually uh, become uh, overwhelmingly bad in the next decade, um, he, Giorgio De Maria started his life as a very gifted musician, uh, uh, an interesting uh, author of um, uh, lyrics for songs and songs, because his, his primary uh, call in life was music. He was a very good uh, virtuoso of uh, piano playing. And uh, and then he moved into writing when, um, because of a arthritis problem, he could not play piano as he's used to. So he switched from music into um, into writing, and he was part of a very small but very elevated clique of uh, Turing uh, writers. Who, and some of the names of these people are known to everybody in the world, Umberto Eco, the name of the rose, uh, and uh, Italo Calvino, the invisible cities, they were all part of this uh, salotto, as we can uh, right. call it. And uh, uh, Giorgio was less well known, even if I was rather prolific, he wrote uh, uh, four uh, full length novels, uh, 20 Days of Turin is now the most famous, but he is uh, uh, another of his novels called The Transgressionist. is going to be released soon uh, uh, in uh, translated by uh, Ramon Glashoff, uh, as it was uh, 20 Days of Turin. But in any case, he was a rather prolific. He was writing for, even wrote for theater, because another of his uh, uh, interests in life was theater. And he was a theater, professional theater critic for um, several newspaper, uh, entire newspaper. So he had various interests. Mm -hmm. But he was a, a, an interesting, a, a person who always seemed to look for uh, a different angle on uh, elements of life. And during the 70s, he started partially because of mistreatment because he was not followed properly, to suffer from um, uh, a sort of what became a mental illness, mm. a full case of schizophrenia, unfortunately, very serious, very serious, with paranoid delusion and everything, that he will explode in the 80s. But in the last, in this part of the 70s, he started to write this book that was, in part, he, 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 the, 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 the style was similar, mm -hmm. this sort of 
grotesque, uh, semi, what we call, we can call it magical realism, mm -hmm. uh, but it is not the kind of magical realism that we have in people like uh, Garcia Marquez or, or Borges. It's it lends more toward horror a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Kind of and, that. and toward, also toward the critique of modernity, because mm -hmm. De Maria was, particularly at the beginning of his career, rather political in his outlook. He was a great criticism of, uh, uh, of capitalism, uh, he had left-wing uh, uh, leaning at the time. And uh, so he was a political, he started as a political author, but then he moved into a, a general critic of society. Mm -hmm. And he, the more he, he went on, the less uh, political his writing, political his mm -hmm. writing became, any more uh, worried about the, the general state of society. And mm -hmm. 20 Days of Turin is a horror, it's basically mm -hmm. a horror book uh, in the style of the, something halfway between Borges and Lovecraft, but it's also a very precise, very accurate picture of what was the Turin, the Italian society, at the end of the 70s, filtered to an enormous sensibility and at the same time, uh, De Maria Mental's trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what the main what was around De Maria at the time? De Maria, by the way, was married with two children, uh, which I, I personally know. And uh, but he was living a, a very isolated life. Uh, he was living inside a uh, uh, home where his family was staying downstairs. He, he was mm -hmm. living most of the time upstairs, writing. So he lived a fairly isolated life. And uh, but around him, societies was collapsing because mm -hmm. Italy was going through a period called the, the years of lead mm -hmm. and of domestic terrorism, of heavy domestic terrorism. And Turin was one of the epicenters of this uh, violence. Political violence was a, a daily occurrence, a daily threat. There were violence coming from the right wing, mostly from the right wing, there was also violence coming from the left. And there was a general sense of malaise. Mm -hmm. uh, Turin at the time was an industrial city, uh, sort of, it was called the, the Italian Detroit because it was the center of car making, mm -hmm. uh, the automotive industry uh, at the time. But the, the industry was collapsing, basically, it was a, going through a period of very rapid deindustrialization. It was a polluted city, uh, which is, I mean, if you are coming to Turin right now, you will wonder where well, all the pollution is gone because <laughs> right. it's one of the greenest city in, uh, in Italy. But back then it was heavily polluted. And it was, De Maria in this book is able to take a very accurate picture of what was like living in Turin at the time, uh, without spoiling the book, because this will be unforgivable. Right. The, sto the story is, and this is another stroke of genius, the story is not set during the 70s. The story is set uh, in the near future. With, by, by, I mean, in the, from the dialogue, you, you guess is the end uh, of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, so it's 20 years in the future, but it's a future, it's very vague mm -hmm. uh, on what happened. And yeah, you can't it, really pinpoint the year when you're reading yeah, it. You know it's, it's sometime in the future and it almost seems like this person is looking back at a time. Exactly, exactly. So it may be 10 years in the future, or, or 10 years in the future, what was the future at the end of the 70s? It can be the beginning of the 90s, or something like, like that. And uh, the world is undergoing a massive drought. There is climate change. It, it is fantastic because at the end of the 70s, nobody was talking about, except few scientists, nobody generally in the general public was discussing climate change. Actually, they were thinking about discussing the possibility of the world cooling down, not warming mm. up. But Turin is under a, a very severe drought. Uh, the rivers are 
all but uh, drive down. And uh, in another interesting bit uh, is that the, because of this, uh, the massive immigration that uh, had reached Turin um, during the, the 50s and the 60s, uh, the immigration from Italian from southern Italy, we went into northern Italy because Italy, Italy, the Turin is in the Italian northwest. All these immigrants who made Turin the largest sprawling urban conglomerate that it is, had gone away, leaving Turin as a sort of empty shell. Only the original inhabitants are still living there. You just have to imagine a, a corpse city in mm -hmm. some way. Uh, and it, there is an interesting bit where the unnamed uh, narrator of the story, we mm -hmm. never know who is the, the narrator of, uh, of the story, says they, they have left us alone, alone with our uh, bad mood, our bad manners. <laughs> And is uh, it's it, it's very interesting because again this was something unthinkable in uh, uh, in the 70s. It, it, this is a prophecy that mm. actually didn't happen during. There is a lot of immigration. Just the immigration right now is not from southern Italy; is from uh, outside Europe. But it, and you have this idea of this city where at all of a sudden, ten years before mm -hmm. the, the start of the story. Um, people was getting murdered in the most bizarre ways in the cities, in the streets, sorry, of Turin. Now, uh, I did, did think this is the, uh, the right moment uh, to, to, you know, put my, my personal story into mm -hmm. this, because my personal story had some link with the book, and some of those links are, are a bit uh, unsettling. Uh, okay, because I if went... I could stop you for a second, I want to go back to the prophesizing because there is an yes. idea of Giorgio de Maria being a kind of prophet, um, and there's several things you're mentioning. Not only climate change, but you're also, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of social media wasn't even a yes, speck the in the library. cosmos. So there's that idea of going into the library and people are spending their time learning about strangers um, and almost becoming obsessed with that. But there's also the idea when you're talking about the murderers, where there's people, murderers are happening around them, and they're almost detached from it. They don't exactly. see it. It's like they're obsessed with something else. I could almost yeah. compare that to people walking around with their heads down on their phone. and Exactly. Like, precisely. precisely. The idea is precisely that. Everybody is living into his own shell. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a self-made shell. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in the book, it's, uh, it's a sort of mass insomnia. So people is just insomniac and they are starting to walk uh, at night uh, in the city streets under this oppressive heat, uh, because again, climate change, and everybody's minding his own business. Right. They're minding it so much, they are not even, you know, seeing those uh, you know, the murders. It's horrific but, uh, murders, right. Exactly, uh, the murders. But, uh, of course, we are not going to tell anyone mm -hmm. the, the identity of the murderers. You, you need to write, to, to read the book to, to see this. But the interesting thing is that the murders, and this is something that can be, can be said, happen in precise landmarks of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those landmarks, the landmarks of the first murder, was near to the place where I lived, I did live, when uh, the book was written. So when the book was released, it was, he, he released and disappeared immediately, okay? He sold a few thousand copies, maybe. Uh, I was one of the people who bought it. I was very young back then, I was an adolescent. And I was reading, I said, oh my God, it's an horror set in my city and near where I live. Right. And you, it's like someone writes the most unsettling, strangest book you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, we all know that when you are 17, 16 or 18, I mean, horror, horror books. Yeah. Wow. Particularly if you are a fan of Lovecraft, as I was mm -hmm. back then, I'm still, a, I am. So it's something like, oh, oh my God, but it's happening. Over there, okay. And the strangest thing is, 
the more you were reading the book, the more those uh, out there element like the library mm. seemed to click in place mm. with the what I was seeing around me. So it was strange because the library is this uh, fictional library where people, I mean, there are, is a, is a, almost a side story mm. inside the, the main uh, narrative line of the book. But, you know, there are these very polite, perfectly neat and well-dressed young people going around and asking everybody, do you have anything like a personal diary, a personal book, anything that you have written you want to give us, we're going to put it into this library and anybody can read that, like a social, a paper Facebook. Okay. Yeah, well, that's a what I was, even the description of the young men walking around reminded me of Silicon Valley in California, yes. if you've ever been there. Exactly. That's the marketing, right? Right. That's the brands, like these, these neat, exactly. nice exactly. gentlemen all dressed the same asking you for your story. Yeah, but, and this is an enormous but, mm -hmm. uh, even if no one around me at the time seemed like that, dressed like that, because at the end of the 70s, and the, mm -hmm. you know, young people were definitely not dressing like this. It made sense in a very strange way. It seemed like, oh, ah, yes, that's it. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, you were saying it seemed like the Maria was a prophet. It was a, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. But the point is not one of those prophets that, yeah, oh yes, uh, he seemed in insight, uh, he seemed to be accurate. He was accurate back then, but very few people seemed able to recognize it. Mm. And at this point, there is a there is a story. I I, I am allowed to to ask it permission mm -hmm. to, to, to 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 say that in in your podcast. Um, at the time, I was frequenting uh, a cafe, and where there was other young people like me, uh, all crazy about um, you know the things that young people. This is in the seventies, right? right? Yeah, the 70s, like music, rock and roll music, and horror books and everything else. And I meet this young guy my age, and uh, we we click, and I, we, we, we discover we have the same passion, and he tell me, okay, you come home at my place, so we're going to, to listen to some rock music. We go home, we listen to that. I remember that very clearly because I, I love the record, and he was a very nice guy. And we, I went home, and uh, shortly after, shortly after, I bought uh, De Maria's book and was mm -hmm. reading the book, and I was fantasizing about who was Giorgio De Maria because mm -hmm. the guy completely disappeared. He never wrote another book. He, the, the, there were three reviews, I remember. It was a sort of mystery. Mm -hmm. um, Forty years later, Ramon Glashoff, the translator of the book, comes to Turin, asks me if there is any, um, is interested in two, having a project to translate, and asks me, is there any Italian book you would suggest that nobody else know you would suggest for uh, translating? And I tell him, oh yeah, Giorgio De Maria, 20 Days of Turin. And Ramon does a fantastic job uh, trying to recover, because he, the author had disappeared, even getting the right, Mm. The rights of the book was difficult, and Ramon did an enormous investigation. He told me, okay, I found the Maria's family, we have a meeting in a cafe in Turin, and uh, can you come so you're going to help me for... And we come, and I entered the cafe, I just, I went pale, because one of the two people sitting mm. in the cafe with Ramon was the same guy, the same kid I've mm. met 40 years before, wow. and, I, and I never met again, mm. and we didn't recognize ourselves, they say, it's, it's you, and so I discovered that right. I, that afternoon, I went to Giorgio De Maria's house, okay, mm -hmm. and he, he, I saw it, like, and for all the time, for 40 years, I, I had wondered who was Giorgio De Maria, where did Giorgio De Maria live, and for a sort of coincidence, uh, 
insane coincidence. Mm. <laughs> I, I met his son 40 years before, shortly after he had released his book. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of the many coincidences. I, I won't really reveal the other because of, uh, uh, it might be the subject for uh, for an article. No, but uh, it, it just means that the book had to be born into the world yes. and it had to yeah. be born now. I think not only was De Maria prophetic in the way that he was able to see things in the future that other people couldn't see, but I think also the themes are universal. Like yes, we both are, are writers, correct? And the 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 theme that most was most important to me as I read the book was this idea of the writers or the artists' role in the art. Like how much of the artist must be seen in the art, especially now when you feel like you have to publicize yourself um, instead of just being putting your art out there. It's like you have to put yourself and the art out there. Okay, yes, uh, this is a recurring theme on, in De Maria. Um, when the transgressionist will be released, uh, I won't reveal the, the story of the transgressionist, it's another uh, completely out there novel, very mm -hmm. different in tone from 20 Days of Turin, but it's still very, very, very strange, very weird. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, uh, Ramon decided to add to the translation, the translation of a sort television story, a, a sort of TV theater, mm -hmm. uh, De Maria wrote in the 70s and was never released because the Italian television read the script and say, no, we cannot do that. And it, it deals with the theme, you say, the role of the author, because it's the story of someone who is invited into um, uh, a TV show, a very peculiar TV show, and we discover that in this TV show, the, the, the protagonist need to make a good impression on the jury of the TV show. Otherwise, something awful will happen to him. And De Maria very explicitly makes a comparison between the, the protagonist of this story and the writer, saying, in the end, do I have to write something to um make a name of myself become mm -hmm. visible right or do i do i have to write something to unsettle and mm -hmm. to you know to to break the people's minds okay right. do we have to uh, uh, the idea is very sim almost simplistic in this script but is do i have to make a good impression right. or can i be completely in the background and disappear yeah. Okay. Right. Can I just be the vehicle instead of having, and then there's the other part of art, which art used to be that you can make art for art's sake. It can mean anything you want, but now there's a level of other people have to like it, which yes. we've never, I don't think we've ever seen at this level. Yes. But the, the, this is the, 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 under, the underlining theme of the library because the library is unsettling because what the most of the, things that you are reading into the library, and to be honest, you're reading in Facebook, are not right. nice. It's, right. very, it's very difficult. There is people who write things that need, you know, they are engineered to be nice, mm -hmm. to be pretty. Uh, I, I mean, I did it myself. I mean, it's a temptation everybody has to make something to get the clicks. Mm -hmm. But in the library, in this paper, social media that Maria invented, a lot of what is written is awful, is absolutely, but it's a deep dive into what are the, the you know, the obsession, the, the problems, the, the, the bad things that happen in the, the people's mind. And, uh, and at this point is explicitly recognizing into the book this awfulness, because at this point the authorities step in and they close the library. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, uh, and it, it becomes something like uh, uh, we, we should not even discuss this. Okay, it's something like a, like a Lovecraftian nightmare. Mm -hmm. But we all know but that the Pandora's box uh, cannot be closed, really. Right. You know, what is, goes in the internet stays in the internet. Mm -hmm. And so from this point of view, very weirdly, 
De Maria was uh, almost uh, uh, consolatory. <laughs> I don't know yeah. the terms. <laughs> it is correct. But remember, I, I don't want to give the, the, your uh, your listener the, the impression the World Book uh, relates only to the library. The library is just right. one element. The main element is the idea of a microcosm mm -hmm. that is collapsing in this, the most nightmarish possible way. And the idea of, again, the named protagonist, who is a everyman, the classic everyman, is right. a great person, is completely great, completely mm -hmm. unremarkable, and is a um, salaryman. He, he's, he's not an artist. He's only uh, artistic call is playing the flute, right. you know, which is uh, it, it is going to be important later in the book. Um, and uh, at some point, he, in his investigation into the murders, he really understands that there is something enormous going on, right. so, something you know gigantic going on. But he can't stop himself. And when he does, when he finally decides to, well, it, it, it's, of course it's too late. But we, I don't want to reveal anything else. But he's the, the, the remarkable, one of the many remarkable things of uh, the 20 Days of Turin is that he's a nightmarish story written in a completely nightmarish uh, uh, moment of Italian history and of Giorgio de Maria personal story mm -hmm. because uh, Giorgio de Maria stopped writing, started to suffer from hallucination, very vivid hallucination. His family told me that he was uh, uh, coming back home saying, I'm seeing uh, the demons and archangels mm -hmm. waiting for me at the corner of the street. So he was... And from what I remember, he wasn't a religious man. So up until this point, he would have necessarily been speaking about angels or demons, would he? No, 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 no. He, he seemed to move uh, you know, a moment of uh, complete hallucinatory mm -hmm. moment of, you know, uh, was clearly disoriented. Mm -hmm. Two moments where he was remarkably uh, present to himself, mm -hmm. even to the point that to descend into uh, real life paranoia. At some point, he started sort of have legal troubles. Mm. Uh, for that, um, because he started to sue people for no reason at all. And he clearly, uh, something that his family told me is that he was following the kind of uh, psychiatric treatment he was getting was wrong. Okay. Mm. At the moment, it would, right now, it would be considered uh, inappropriate. Mm. Uh, but going and, back, he, he wrote a book in 20 Days of Turn, he's writing about people putting themselves in a smaller microcosm in this microcosm, and yet he was also living a life where he's in a microcosm in the microcosm. Do you think that yes. also led to his yes. own mental health issues? Uh, it's, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. to be honest, because this is something I have often discussed with, with family. And both his, uh, by the way, both of his uh, uh, children are gifted artists. Mm. Okay, his daughter uh, Cora, she's an opera singer, and she's also a, uh, she does uh, a shadow theater. She's a sort of puppeteer, but mm -hmm. she uses elaborate uh, shadow puppets, and she makes fantastic shows. She did also a couple of years before the pandemic. She did also a show on based on uh, the Twenty Days of Turin. Oh, that was interesting! Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And uh, Domenico uh, is a son, is a visual artist, is a painter, uh, is a decorator for very elaborate uh, uh, house uh, decoration. And so, so they are both gifted people. Mm. And De Maria, Giorgio De Maria himself was a, an artist of many colleagues. He was a very good writer, he was a very good musician, uh, he was a very good uh, theater writer, for instance. Mm -hmm. He brought some, some very interesting piece. Um, at the same time, there was an element of uh, sense uh, of the, the, the problem he had with his hand, the arthritis, 
was one signal of this. A sense of not being able, mm -hmm. having an internal call, having all the talent to do things, but being prevented by mm -hmm. nature, health, or the society to mm -hmm. reach what your, this is the goal you want to reach. Uh, De Maria was a very litigious character all his life, not just in the latter part of his life, and he was definitely someone who could put himself in trouble uh, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, make his point, okay. But he still, you get this sense of frustration of someone who knows uh, he has an enormous potential, mm -hmm. and he don't, he's not seeing his potential recognized. Um, the, the, financial uh, and you know, book charts in, mm -hmm. uh, in success of his books is something that probably uh, created probably him. Probably haunted him. Yeah, probably haunted yeah. him. Because he, you know you're writing fantastic stuff and nobody seems to care. And there seems to be a, a sort of cosmic uh, uh, plot mm -hmm. to make sure nobody will uh, recognize uh, uh, your your talent uh, just for 20, 40 years later and uh, 10 years after you are dead uh, everybody all the world uh, discover I, but I feel like that happens to so many artists that's the challenge of the artist right I was just reading about Jane Austen how nobody even knew she wrote a book until 10 20 years after she died you know and now everybody knows her name everywhere but there's, yes. there's some truth that calls to this book. There's some universal truth that called to Italian students or adolescents in the 70s that's kind of calling to us again. Do you know what, what yes. that is? What draws us to something like this in those two specific time periods? But one thing is, uh, uh, there is one element that um, De Maria seems to repeat uh, in... Uh, all his work uh, is that uh, you you need to have uh, you you need to survive in order to survive you need to be completely perfectly honest with yourself mm. uh, and this is something that happens many times uh, the bad people in his books or the people who end up failing is people who at some moment seems to make compromise with the mm. forces of darkness, okay? Mm. And having, uh, it, it is strange because De Maria was not a moralist, but he seems to have a moral statue. Uh, it's interesting that uh, one of the few positive characters uh, uh, books is, uh, the, is based, is, is called in the 20 Days of Turin, is the lawyer, Segre, mm. Uh, who is based on a real life friend of De Maria, who is still living uh, right now, is, is still alive. And uh, he is sympathetic because he's, he's the only one that seems to be completely honest of what's happening mm. around. He calls, calls it the name it is. Everybody else seems to live into this shell of illusion. But, right. you know, telling yourself lies, not recognizing that. You know, there is apocalypse literally yeah. going on, right. uh, and the society is collapsing. And <clears throat> you have this idea of the hypocrisy that definitely was there in the 70s, because I remember mm -hmm. that there was violence uh, in the street every day, and a lot of people seemed to pretend it, it, it was not happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and De Maria say, telling us that this hypocrisy this hypocrisy is deadly, mm -hmm. ultimately, is completely deadly. Deluding yourself that you are not into this such nightmarish situation, uh, refusing to call things with their names, mm -hmm. literally generates monsters, okay? And th this is the first thing. And the other thing is, but I, I just... I'm, I will just briefly mention it because you need to read the book to understand mm -hmm. this. I don't want to spoil the book. Is that a monster cannot be it forever. Mm. Uh, uh, if there are real monsters, they will come out sooner right. or later. And this is an element that seems to worry uh, very much uh, De Maria. 
uh, of this idea of monster or something repressed that it, if they will eventually come to the light, they will mm -hmm. eventually explode and take over the world. And, and we are not necessarily, you know, talking about Lovecraftian monster with tentacles and everything else. Mm -hmm. Monster right. can be can be completely different. And you will if you read the book. The monsters there are, are completely different. Right, absolutely. but I guess what he's saying is that there's monsters out here. There's real monsters that we need to be aware of, but maybe the deadlier monster is the monster inside of us that we keep pushing down and pretending it's not. Yes, there. yes, and in the end, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's this idea of the a self-built apocalypse. Is that the idea of the, we are going to build the apocalypse? That is, I mean, is a popular theme right now if right. you're thinking about uh, uh, Don't Look Up, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Netflix uh, the Netflix movie, this idea that we are ultimately responsible for what is happening to us. And sometimes this is a bit too easy because sometimes, very often, we are not responsible mm -hmm. for that. But there are elements, uh, the monster inside us, that is pressuring to come out. Mm -hmm. And in De Maria, uh, this, this pressure, you can feel it. Okay. They, the great success, artistic success of uh, the 20 Days of Turin is that in, in a very short, compact book, mm -hmm. he managed to give you really the idea of uh, a, a pathology, a, a word that is pathologically sick. Yeah. Okay. And you can feel this sickness. That is not just the sickness of some people, it's a general sickness. And it is very difficult to do that. There are other authors who have tried at length mm -hmm. to create this kind of uh, scenario. But in my opinion, nobody has reached the, the, uh, the success and the, the haunting ability mm -hmm. of the Maria to create a nightmarish uh, uh, scenario, a nightmarish uh, society. And it is, is haunting. It, I tell you, I finished the book three weeks ago and it's still something I think back on like, wait, did that really happen? Is that happening? Did I read it how it was supposed to? Yeah, is, yes, it's you the know? big question, it's the big question. Uh, I tell you that the, the Luca of uh, the end of the 70s would say, yes, it did happen. The look of uh, the 2022 is not so sure, but it, I think it will be a cop-out to yeah. say it, it may well, <laughs> maybe it was just an hallucination. The point is, it may be that particularly the second part of the book uh, is uh, all in the author, all in the narrator's mind. But there are signs, uh, uh, clear signs, that uh, De Maria is dropping here and there in the book. It will tell you, no, this is the reality. This is really going on. Maybe there is some, your mind is embellishing something, you know, it's creating the more Baroque part. But the heart of the story is uh, real. And exactly. it's real, I feel like it's real now. Like these bigger themes, in the same way that we look at a painting, and they evoke feelings we can't speak into language yes. is the same yes. way the book kind of brings up these bigger feelings. This idea of uh, mental illness coupled with uh, a, a sort of social media, the exposure of your inner thought to the public uh, mm -hmm. and the relationship between the two things, yes, is absolutely modern, is more modern than ever. And uh, uh, I mean, that would take us probably way too long to describe it, but it's one of the great triumphs of the book. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, this was completely anticipatory. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and I, I don't want to talk any more about the book because I really, really, really want folks to read this. And I'm, I'm thinking of reading it again or two and three times. So I think I keep thinking I missed something. Um, <laughs> But I want you to. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and helping us to explore uh, yeah, these bigger yeah, absolutely. themes that we it was a pleasure. Been able to. So, thank you so okay. much. Um, thanks to you. See you soon. And thanks to all the people listening to the, this podcast. Okay. Right. Thank you very thanks much. So much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.